Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight still alive. We are glad you're still on this side of the dirt. Amen. I'd rather be here in the best hospital in the city. I'd rather be here than the best prison in the state. Hmm? Amen. And that's probably where I would be had it not been for Jesus. Hallelujah. So I'm still thankful. Still thankful. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Romans 12 tonight. We're talking about this part three of your gift and your war. Your gift and your war. Because every one of you have gifts and every gift has a warfare connected to it. There's the positive and the negative side of every gift. Every temperament has strengths and weaknesses. And guess where you get attacked? Hmm? Hmm? Let me ask you a question. If you're going to fight somebody, do you go after where they're strong or after where they're weak? Well, the devil's a little smarter than you, so what do you think he's going to do? Hmm? He's going to come after you where you're weak. He's going to attack gifts in their soft side. And he loves to find niches in our armor. Amen? He's an expert. He's been examining you. He's been following you. He's been studying you from the day you were born. And just as we have... The Lord's assignments in our lives, the kingdom of darkness also has assignments in your lives. And so he will work hard to keep you out of your gift, to keep you from being effective in your gift. He'll try his hardest to keep you out of the design God had for you. And he's, you know, his his, uh, strategies never really change. They're as old as the Garden of Eden. First thing he wants to do is get you to question God. Do you even have a gift? One of the first things, even though the word of God says every one of you do, I hear Christians all all the time saying, well, I don't even know if I have a gift. Well, the devil's already got in your ear. He's already got you questioning whether God's word is true or not. And then he offers up false evidence through reason. Because, you know, the devil communicates to us through the tree of knowledge. He comes to us with information. He comes to us through reason. He comes to us through mental understanding. But the Word of God comes to us in revelation, inspiration, and impartation. That's how the Spirit communicates to us. And so we want to be on that side. Can you say amen? Amen. All right, let's welcome the Holy Ghost. Stand one more time before we get into the Word. We want to give honor to our teacher here tonight, because I got news for you, I can't teach you anything. Not when it comes to the Word of God. I mean, I can teach you a few things in the natural, but I can't teach you anything in the Spirit. If the Holy Ghost don't come, we walk out as dumb as we walked in. Amen? I don't know about you, but I got better things to do than to waste time. And I can beat my gums till your ears fall off the side of your head. But if the Holy Ghost don't come, we don't grow. Amen? So let's welcome him tonight. Holy Spirit, we just honor you, sir. We welcome you into this house. We welcome you into this portion of our service as we've worshipped our Lord Jesus. And we've attempted in spirit and in truth to honor him through worship and praise. Now we honor you through giving you our full attention. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, the ears of our hearing. Let our hearts comprehend fully what glory you have for the saints. That we may understand with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. Show us the full dimension of the word and the counsel of God here tonight, Holy Ghost. I pray that you speak through me. I pray that you energize the very atmosphere of this room. And I pray that your word would just explode on the inside of our hearts. That each of us will be enriched in all spiritual things. That we would become partakers of the divine nature through these exceedingly great precious promises in the word of God. And We thank you for this Holy Spirit. And again, we honor you tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. 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 You can be seated. Back to Romans chapter 12. Just read verse 1 and then we'll move on down. 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, that by the mercies of God you present your bodies a living sacrifice. First thing you got to do if you want to fulfill your call is deal with your body. The first thing Jesus did with the anointing when he came up out of the baptismal waters and the Spirit descended on him in, like a dove, the first thing he did, the Scripture said the Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tested. And the first thing he did with the anointing was overcome his own heart, his own flesh. He fasted 40 days. That's the number of testing. So he passed the test. And it was the first thing he did with his anointing. He put his body under. Satan came to him and said, you're hungry. Make some bread. I won't eat that. I'll live by the word of God. I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if we're going to walk in our call, we've got to get our flesh under. This morning, I got an, uh, one of my blogs came in. Three huge national pastors just recently, all resigned their pulpits, caught in adultery. Large, mega church pastors, one in Orlando, you know. I mean, it's just so sad. Why? Somebody didn't kill his body. Somebody didn't put his flesh under. And believe me, you can start in the race and be disqualified right before you finish, cross the finish line. And these men started in glory, built huge mega churches, and then end up in that kind of mess. What a horrible way to finish your race. Can you say amen? I don't want to ever do that. So you present your body a living sacrifice, holy. That's how we qualify a living sacrifice. It's got to be holy. There's this huge movement across America to remove holy from spirit. To remove holy from church activities. To remove holy from Christian living. We want to sanctify the world's stuff and call it Christian. Baloney with a capital B. Don't let anybody tell you that these sins are not sin anymore. Sanctify yourself holy if you want to fulfill your call. If you want to move into God's destiny for your life. The next thing is don't be conformed to the world. Say this with me. I can't be worldly, can't be worldly. And, godly and godly at the same time. The word worldly means acting like world people. Christians ought to be visibly different. They ought to be, of course, spiritually different. And they ought to be different in their manner of life. People shouldn't have to be around you very long before they figure out you're not like them. You shouldn't try to look like them, quote, by, you know, sometimes the latest trends and fads are not godly. You know, Dennis got shared, or somebody got shared the other day about the new hot pants the chicks are all wearing this year. You know, and, and I, I was somewhere the other day, and my, I was like, yeah. I mean, there was nothing left in the imagination. Ladies, don't you wear that mess to church. You're going to wear shorts to church. Get them down here. Don't you come in here with these shorts cut up here. I ask you to leave. Worldly. You go take that lust somewhere else. And then the girls will say, well, the men shouldn't be lusting. What are you advertising for? If you need a husband that bad. That you got to be half naked to try to attract a man. And you men don't, well, I, I mean, Christian men today, they come in, painted up like the most worldly guys in our, you know, ears this big, hardware, they look like Ace Hardware Store and they walk in. Let me ask you a question. Is that what Jesus would do if he was here today? And if you say you don't know, you need to go back and read your Bible. Worldly. People think just because I'm 16 or 18 or 22, I, can, I don't have to keep the ancient holy standards. You better go back and read your Bible again. You've been deceived, dear one. You say, well, Dave, don't say that. All the young people will leave. 
Well, I'm sorry. I'm not changing my Bible for any age group. Holy, not worldly. All the old people said amen. All the young people said. Anyway, I used to be a young people. Now I'm an old people. The next thing, don't, we've got to be renewed in our minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, when you get your mind renewed, you don't want to live, look, smell, walk, talk, do the things the world does anymore. You want to do the things heaven does. Amen. You're not interested in trying to look like the world. You're interested in trying to look like heaven. Amen. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and you get your mind renewed. That you may prove what is the perfect, good, and perfect will of God. A lot of people don't even know what the will of God is. So you've got to go back and be proved. Your life should be approved by the Lord. Amen. Well, amen or oh me. So, then we went down and we began to look at the gifts. And we're not going to go through those again, except we're going to pick up where we left off. And uh, we were talking about the expectations of leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop in the biblical term was not just a senior leader over a group of churches like is in today's church culture. The word bishop means to oversee. Every church should have many bishops. Why? We have people overseeing people. And when you're an overseer, you should fit the qualifications of an overseer. And overseers aren't supposed to be like normal people. Some people want to be in leadership, but they don't want to pay the price that the Bible requires. And again, we don't change these standards just because we're in the 21st century. These standards are forever. Holy is the same meaning today as it was 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. Amen? It goes on to say this, a bishop must be blameless. There shouldn't be anybody having anything against you if it's godly. I mean, there should be no ungodly accusation against anybody who wants to be in leadership in this church. That's an expectation. He should be um, the husband of one wife. We talked about it. He can't be a polygamist. Temperate. That means he can control his emotions. He's not given to outbursts of anger. And that's a tough one today because a lot of people don't know how to control their emotions. You have three ages. You have a physical age. You have a spiritual age. And then you have an emotional age. And there are 40 and 50-year-old people who have a spiritual age of 10 or 12, and an emotional age of a three-year-old. In other words, your emotional age is gauged by how you react in conflict. If you act like a toddler in conflict, that's your emotional age. And you're stuck there until you grow up. Amen? Temperate. He should be sober-minded. You know, sometimes people get too spooky to be in leadership. Spiritual is not necessarily spooky. Spiritual is also practical. I mean, we've had to, you know, reel people in, so to speak, because they got way out too far. And they started, and it's not really that they were too spiritual. It was they were too flaky. It wasn't spiritual. It was human thinking it was spiritual. It was exalted opinions. It's when people begin to get out into the spirit and they go past where the Lord is and they start living in their imagination and everything that comes in their mind they think is God. Sober-minded. You got to be able to be reeled back in when you need to be. Amen? And sober-minded also means whatever I do can be judged and measured of good behavior, hospitable, you got to like people. Some people want to be in the ministry, but they don't like people. The ministry is people. 
That's what the ministry is. The ministry, you know, is not preaching. This is preaching to full-time ministry is like sex to a marriage. It's not that often, and it's quick. <laughs> and then you got to live together. You know, I preach three times a week, 45 minutes to an hour. I'm in this 70, 80 hours a week. So three out of 70, 80 hours, I get to do this. The rest of the time, it's trying to resolve conflicts. It's trying to help people overcome. It's trying to bring a person from this place to this place. It's trying to administrate in the kingdom. It's trying to run an organization, pay bills, maintain properties. Like I say, to be a pastor today, you need to be a CPA. You need to be a businessman. You need to be a psychologist. You need to be a man of God, of course. You need to have teaching and preaching gifts. Man, it's, it's, it's a bunch of hats we wear. So preaching is just a part of it. Hospitable, able to teach. You've got to be able to do that. A lot of people want to preach, but they have no gift for it. They do great one-on-one. -on -one. You put them in front of a crowd, and they bore you to death. I've seen people spend their whole life thinking they were called to preach, frustrated and feeling like a failure when they have no articulate gift. And, and it's sad because somebody told them because they were zealous for God. Here's how it works in the world. The world is so cold. The world is so cold spiritually. Anytime someone gets genuinely saved and full of zeal because there's such a contrast between a truly saved person and the world or the carnal church, the minute you demonstrate a little zeal that should be every believer's zeal, they think you're called to be a preacher. And they'll start telling you, well, my God, you're, you're called to preach. And then you get aspirations. Oh, you see the angelic choir behind you. You see yourself standing in the pulpit. And you know what you'll see in front of you? for a few weeks, and then there won't be anybody. But one-on-one, -on -one, man, you rock the world. You know, I tell a story about Brian Adams' dad, and um, he, he's in heaven now. Brian Adams' dad came to our church, and he was in his early 60s. This was back in 1986. And Brian Adams' dad came in my office one day, and he, he, he said he was a, a failure and I just met him, and he said he was a failure. And I said, well, why are you a failure? And he said, because I was called to preach. But I was in a certain denomination, and I got divorced, and they told me I could never preach because I was divorced. And I said, well, I don't believe that. I said, are, you really have a call to preach? And he said, absolutely. He said, man, from the time I was just five years old, I knew I was called to preach. And I'm now I'm 60s, and I've never done it. So I said, well, let's, let's step you up to the plate. He struck out. I mean, it was horrible. Horrible. Wasn't it Larry? Larry was there. Dude. I was like, son, you ain't called to preach. So I sat down one day. I said, what do you think about doing some evangelism on the streets? Well, I mean, I can if that's what you want me to do, but I really am called to preach. I said, well, let's just leave the preach lay a minute. What do you think about going out and leading a soul winning team? Well, I could. So I, I got him uh, some people who were interested in evangelism, uh, evangelism kind of like our Elevate team now. And uh, he started going out every Saturday night on the streets of Jackson. And dude, Sunday morning, he'd come in with his five or six people. And they'd be telling about healings and miracles and salvations and people getting baptized in the Holy Ghost on Main Street. I mean, every week they had testimonies. And I said, dude, this works for you. Yeah, but I'm called to preach. I said, no, you're not. I will be your Simon. You're not called to preach from a pulpit. You're called to preach one-on-one. -on -one, and you do great at that. But you put you in front of people and you, you have no gift you have no charisma for a crowd, but you have charisma for small gatherings, one-on-one, two-on-two, three-on-three. Do you know he was in our church 
for the next 15 years. Never, always disgruntled, always feeling like a failure. He died feeling like he'd failed God. And so I finally nailed him down one day. I said, Richard, I said, who told you you were called to preach? My mother. There you go. Thanks, Mom. You made a man miserable his whole life because you put a false expectation in him and you misidentified his calling and his gifting. And he believed it because he saw honor and glory in it. The aspirations for the pulpit are mainly motivated by honor and glory, not by gifting. And we got to be careful with that. There are very few people that will ever be a senior leader of a local church. Not that many. Why? We don't need that many senior leaders of local churches. We need them for the churches that are being raised up, the churches that are here. But how many of y'all know, there, you know there's 600 people that call this place home right now? We don't need 600 senior leaders in Parkersburg, West Virginia. We just need the ones that we need. So, you know, I want you to realize that because there ain't nothing worse than living under a false expectation and making yourself miserable for a lifetime. And I've seen too many people do it. And then if perchance someone did give you the opportunity, you would not only be miserable, but you'd make a whole group of people miserable with you because then they would feel disloyal if they didn't stay with you. That's how you get so many little churches that never grow. They have no vision. They never impact a city or a region. They're Bible studies. Being led by a person who was probably an elder, maybe a bishop of a small group. You say, if your church never grows past 30, that's your lid. That's where you were supposed to be. Amen. I hope that helps somebody stay out of a lifetime of frustration. It goes on to say, uh, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine. We talked about that last time. Even though wine drinking is now the big popular new thing with young believers, stay away from it. That is a spirit. That's why you even see the world calls it spirits. Why? Because alcohol has the ability to change your consciousness. Mountain Dew don't. It'll make you fat, but it won't make you sin in the sense of that. Stay away from it. I'm telling you, it is nothing but a poisonous viper in the end. And it'll be one glass, then it'll be two glasses, it'll be three glasses. And I've sat at the table with the wine-drinking preachers, and they'll stand there and tell you, this is culture, this has nothing to do with alcohol, and by the end of the night, they're all drunker and skunks. Don't tell me. It's deception. Hundreds of beverages without alcohol are at your fingertips in every store in America, but you've got to go for the one that's got the fangs in it. Be careful, dear one. Be careful. Not only that, if you can control it, the, your, your teenager, when you're at your teenager's arraignment because they got in your liquor cabinet, because that 14 or 15-year-old couldn't control it, and they sent a fam- family of five into eternity when they took your car, all of a sudden you'll have a new revelation about sipping saints. Not violent. Dude, don't punch people out if you're going to be a leader. Don't be a fighting saint. Vengeance is mine. I'll punch him out, says the Lord. That's my translation. Not greedy for money. You know, money and authority amplify whatever is inside of a human being. And that's why so few can handle it. So few can handle it. I'm telling you, man, don't, money does not, things don't make you happy. Places don't make you happy. I promise you this. If you're not happy here, you wouldn't be happy anywhere. Happiness comes from a contentment in Christ in your heart. Now, you may have geographical preferences. You may have for your, you know, for what you want to do. But I'm just saying, if you're not happy here, you won't be happy there. I know I lived that. Unhappiness is not a position, a place, a place. A position of, you know, monetary influence, how many things I got, that's not unhappiness. And go out and look at the rich. They're the most unhappy people on the planet. 
You know, I live in a pretty affluent neighborhood in this city. You ought to see the people drive up and down my street. Ain't none of them. They won't even smile. They won't even wave. I'm like, hey, how you doing? They're like, you know, and I'm like, man, that is one miserable human being right there. And they got more money than me and you all together. They got more money in God, so to speak. And they're miserable. Because all they're worried about is somebody trying to get their money. If you're a single man and you have money, God help you find a wife. Because every wife you'll be wondering, are they after my money? Thank God you ain't got no money if you're looking for a wife. <laughs> not greedy. Gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Look at a man's family and you'll know his nature. I mean, if the preacher comes in, his wife looks like he drug her to church behind the pickup truck. His kids are a bunch of demons. Find another church. Good clue right there. Amen. If a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? You, if you have aspirations for leadership, it begins at home. Amen. And you, you ain't going to live in a hell home and then come in here and be a hypocrite. Amen. Your wife, if you're a man, ought to be singing your praises. If you're a woman, your husband ought to be singing your praises. And if they're not, that's a clue. Amen. Not a novice. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. You know, we're an adolescent church. This church is, is uh, going to be 13 years old in August. We're an adolescent church. We have a lot of our leaders that have been here, you know, maybe 3 to 10 years, most of our leaders. And most of our leaders are in adolescence. And not all of them are ready for full authority yet. And the worst thing I've ever done as a leader is to promote someone prematurely. I've hurt people by giving them too much too soon, and they couldn't, control, they couldn't handle it. They got the puff head. You know, when you give someone, like I say, when you give someone money or authority, it, it, it amplifies anything inside them. So if they haven't been walking long enough in the wilderness to where they've been humbled to a point to where nothing, there's nothing left to amplify. Amen. Your flesh is dead, man. You know? I mean, people walk up to me sometimes, they'll say, man, that was the best message I ever heard. And I just laugh inside and say, <laughs> we both know, don't we? Anything you see good in me came from God. Amen. Without Jesus Christ, I'd be down to nipping you tonight. Without Jesus Christ, I'd be the latest arraignment down at the court. I'd be filling a prison cell. So I'd be somewhere wrecked because everything good in me came from Jesus. And the minute you lose that attitude, you're done as a leader. You're going to pop when your head gets big enough. Amen? And so we've got we've to make sure that we don't get the puffhead devil. With pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. You know what the devil said? I want to be like God. Some of you may be sitting here tonight saying, I want to be like Pastor Dave. Check your motive. I want to I have a church bigger than you. Check your motive. Check your heart. Make sure that the spirit of pride is not motivating you. There's a difference between the call of God and the spirit of pride. Both are a motive. Both are a motivator. But if you have aspirations for leadership, you've got to have pride checked in your heart. Amen? Amen. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are on the outside, lest he fall into a reproach in the snare of the devil. You know, there's nothing worse. My, my, I'll never forget, my sister was a banker for many, many years, and we, had a, we went to church as a young man, and uh, we were in a denominational church, and we had a pastor, and he was everybody's favorite pastor. I mean, of all the pastors we had grown up, and this denomination changed pastors every two years. Of all of them I ever remember, this guy everybody liked the most. And my sister was a teenager, you know. She was like, I think she just graduated 18, and she was working at the local bank. And she would come home, 
And she was so embarrassed because our pastor, she played the organ, man. She played the Dracula organ for the church. She played the organ. And the pastor would come in and the tellers would all not want to wait on him because they weren't allowed to cash his checks because he'd hung so much paper all over town. He had newspaper, I mean, he had wallpapered half the businesses in town. And the tellers didn't want to face a pastor and say, I'm sorry, I can't cash your check. And that she said it was so embarrassing. That's part of what, what we're talking about here. We should have a good reputation for being honest. We should have a, I mean, anyone we've ever done business with in this city or anyone that's d did business with the Rock Organization for the last 27 years, we've never had a late bill. Not once in 27 years from any of the churches. We maintain a good standard with our uh, business people, with the people we do business with. If we make an, uh, a promise, we do our best. And I've taken an... I've, I've taken my own money out of my own checking account to make sure a utility bill at a church wasn't late. Why, we've got to have a good witness with the people out here. When we were building this church, everybody got paid. And every contractor that walked in here, I can name a church in town, it's one of the largest churches in this city, and the contractors that came in here told us that preacher is the biggest liar on planet Earth. He ripped us off. We never got paid. I heard story after story after story from churches in this community that these contractors had worked for. I had contractors come in and say, I won't even work for a church. I had one contractor come in and said, I'll work for a church, but I'll get paid before the work because the last three churches I worked for didn't pay me. And these are large churches in town that got money sitting in trust funds. Millions probably. We paid every bill we had. You can call up anyone that's ever worked for this church. we got to have a good reputation with those who are without. Amen? Now, we also have a reputation of being a little more spiritual than most, and we can't help that. <laughs> yes, we do speak in tongues, cast out devils, pray for the sick to be healed, prophesy. We're not going to change that for anybody. Amen. Now, the next step, it says... There's deacon qualifications. Now, we have bishop qualifications, which are overseers. Deacons are servants in the house. You know, we just went through a thing where we re, uh, redid all of our workers in the church and leaders and had them, because we found out a lot of our leaders and workers didn't realize we had certain standards in our ministry, and they began to break some of the standards. So we had to go back and say, hey, 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 wait a minute. We got these standards we have to do. And so we gave a worker form out and a leader form out. We had everybody go through them. Because we want you to know what, this is a, my expectation of you if you're going to serve in the house of God. A deacon is a servant in the house of God. It would be an usher. It would be a, a uh, I would consider a children's church teacher in the realm of a deacon or the responsibility of a deacon. I would consider uh, doing anything to where you are in front of people and being identified as in charge of something now, you need to have a standard, too, in your life. Here's some of the standards for deacons. They must be, re uh, must be reverent. Now, some of you guys under 40 need to go back and read what reverent means because some of you have a very disrespectful attitude in your culture. And I'm sorry that, you know, you were raised up without any true spiritual authority in your life, and maybe the authorities in your life were wrong, but you know what? That doesn't change anything in the Word of God. Some people say, well, because I was, you know, abused as a child, I don't have to be reverent to authority. No, 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 dear one. We got to be reverent if we're going to serve in the house of God. Why? This is the kingdom of God. This ain't your dysfunctional home. And He is the Father, not your messed up daddy. And maybe your daddy let you down. He will not let you down. Maybe your mama wasn't there for you. He will always be there for you. So we are not going to project our failures with authority against kingdom authority. Some people say, well, I can't trust somebody in the church. I ain't submitting to that. Well, then you're not going to, you're not going to go very far in the house of God. And when you get mad and leave this church, when you go to the next church, be sure and walk up the pastor and tell him why you left this church. I ain't submitting to nobody. 
Because he needs to know that when you come in so he don't waste a year with you. Still want to be a leader? <laughs> it goes on to say, not double-tongued. Watch your mouth. Five times the book of Proverbs says, the words of a talebearer are tasty trifles. But they do massive damage in the house of God. Five times that is warned in the book of Proverbs alone. So let's be very cautious that we're not talking out of both sides of our mouth. Um, not given to much wine. Here it is again. Put away the alcohol. Not greedy for money. Why? You might be carrying the offering back to the office and we don't want it to light. We don't want you to lighten God's load between here and the office door. You wouldn't believe. Listen to me. You think I'm joking. When we, when we started this church and we opened our cafe, cafe there's, there's cash that goes through there. And we finally, after we caught people stealing several times, I said, let's just stick a video camera up in there and that'll stop that mess. Angie came to me, who was our grill cafe manager, and she said, Pastor, you aren't going to believe this. And I said, what? She said, our average cash went up almost $200 a week after we stuck that video camera up in there. Let me tell you something, man. It's hard to say no to money when you need it. And if you're sitting here and your cell phone's going to be shut off tomorrow and you work in the cafe and you see three, three $20 bills that we ain't even going to miss, and then you might even say, well, you know what? I should get, be getting paid more for doing this anyway. <laughs> Not greedy for money if you're going to be in ministry. Amen. I've been amazed as a pastor over the years at how many things are stolen from churches. I mean, I've just sat there. I mean, we actually had a situation where one of our sisters sat down to get a burger, walked to the bathroom. We had a person walk over, get her purse, take $100 bills out of her purse, put her purse back. We had it all on video. We called the person and said, you bring her the $100 back. I didn't take any money. Swore on God's holy Bible. She didn't take anything. I said, honey, we got you on video. The $100 showed up. <laughs> and we never saw that person again. They were in too much shame at that point to even come back and worship. Not that we wouldn't have forgiven and restored, but we would not give you access to anybody's purse. Because you're greedy for money. Amen. So we got to be, you know, I mean, it's sad that we even have to have these things and take up precious places in the Bible form, but we never change. Flesh is flesh is flesh, whether it was 2,000 years ago or 20 minutes ago. We all have the same temptations. We all have the same warfare in our giftings. Amen? So we got to do that. It goes on to say, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. You know, your conscience, if it's not pure, you're not going to have boldness. You need to have boldness to work in the Spirit. Holding, uh, but let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons. Well, today, here's what the church growth gurus say. I've, I've been to seminars and, and read the blogs. You know what the mega church people say? As soon as somebody walks in your door, you get them working. Why? Because if you get them working, they'll stay. They'll fill a seat. So you give them a job the minute they walk in. Get them doing something. I'm like, no, no, I'm going to run a background check on you before I put you back here with my kids. There's at least 30 perverts within a quarter mile of here, you know. Read, go on the website and see the balloons. Let them be tested first. So there needs to be, you know, we need to know something about you before we empower you. Some people say, well, you can't make people just sit. Well, until they're tested, we need to know who, who know them the labor among you, the Scripture teaches us. Amen? Now, I know that's not popular with the church growth people, but, hey, there's different ways to grow a church. I want to grow one that we won't be being sued next year because somebody molested a kid back there in the gymnasium. 
I'd rather just, you know, settle down a little bit and say, let's just see what you're made of before we empower you. And, and you know, then let them serve being found blameless. Boy, that's a tough one, ain't it? How do you find blameless people in this culture? When everybody does what's right in their own eyes, when everybody makes up their own rules because they don't have to submit to the ones of the Bible anymore. These are old-fashioned. It's a tough deal to find leaders in the house of God. And I wish we had more leaders who were fulfilling these things so we could do more. But it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm, I'm telling you, there are standards, and, and these standards are not you know, easily found in our culture today. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be husbands of one wife. Again, ruling their children, their house as well. The, the standards are not much different between a worker, a server, and a leader. Do you notice that? It's pretty much the same mirror image, isn't it? In other words... This is what God expects out of his people of influence. Whether your influence is through serving or teaching or leading. For those who have served well as deacons. Oh, here we go. Now let's talk about reward. We don't do all this for nothing. Those who served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. So that's, that's what, you know, we're up against when it comes to leading in the house of God. Now back over to Romans 12, he who shows mercy, and that whole section was over he who leads or governments in the church. The next one is he who shows mercy. Now here's the, here's the motivator or here's the, the warning, you can look at it either way, for mercy motivated people. How many mercy motivated people we got in the house? You know you have a mercy motivation. Come on. I wonder who you are, because I may need you when I'm not feeling good. Lift your hand high. I know I have a mercy motivation. I have an extreme compassion for people in my heart. I just want to help people that are hurting. Come on. I might be just waking you up right now. Look, man, look around. There's a bunch of mercy in this house. Well, guess what? The Scripture says mercy, uh, mercy and truth have kissed. Amen? So you need to find all the prophecy people and give them a big hug. <laughs> Amen? Mercy and truth of kids. So mercy, here's what the Lord says about mercy people. With cheerfulness. What's your warfare if you're mercy motivated? Well, mercy people have to stay in the joy of the Lord. Why? Because your gift is to minister to hurting people. It's easy to take someone else's pain on to the point of losing your own joy. Now, here's what I learned early as a, as a minister. As a young pastor, I learned that mercy people are the people who seem to fight offenses the hardest in the church. I was amazed when I discovered this. In their mercy gift... They take on every person's, not only pain, but they take on their offenses. <laughs> What's the matter, honey? Pastor Dave stepped on my big toe. <laughs> he did what? Did he say, excuse me? No, that makes it even worse. <laughs> And you'll wipe their brow and then come punch me in the eye. <laughs> now you think I'm exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating a bit. Here Paul says you've got to maintain cheerfulness. You've got to stay in the joy of the Lord, man. Don't let another person's pain or offense become yours. Because you'll get miserable real quick. Mercy is such a wonderful manifestation. It's the manifestation of the compassion of God. But those giving it must not get consumed by those they're giving it to. 
Another thing about mercy people, you'll find there's, there's two, two manifestations that work in warfare against the mercy gift. There's what we call an, an enabler or a, you know, there's dependent and there's codependent, codependency. Dependent is, I need. That's dependent. Codependent is, I need to be needed. And those two gifts attract like a magnet. And sometimes the codependent, which is, I think, just a misdirected mercy gift, gets latched onto by the dependent. And the codependent, instead of leading them into victory in Christ, becomes an enabler and can even hijack the dealings of God going on in this person's life. What we call enabling. Enabling is when you stop someone from growing because you keep them in that present state of self-deception. They're never going to get the blessing of God until they come out of that mindset, out of that sin, out of that mess. But your compassion overrides your prophecy, your truth. And so you got to be careful because... I don't want to try to hijack someone who's in the chastening of the Lord with a mercy gift. How many of y'all know the scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he spanks? Well, make sure you ain't trying to pull someone out of the spanking of God. Say, whoa, 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 God, you, you stop that. God says, you don't know what's going on in that heart. I do. And I've got them in my dealings. Now, you leave them alone. That's the warfare a lot of times with mercy. Mercy people have to resist that temptation and always try to find out what someone's, what is the root of their pain? What is the root? And deal with the root in your mercy gift, not just the fruit. You got to find the root or else you might just keep, you know one thing about fruit, you pick it, it'll grow back. And you walk around and pick fruit all day long, and it'll just grow back. But when you get to the root of the matter, you'll deal with the fruit of the matter. And so go a little deeper, mercy folks. Don't take on their offenses. You can't carry their pain. You know, God may put a burden on you for a time of intercession, but you should come out of that with the joy of the Lord. I know whenever I carry a burden in prayer, I always come out of that with the joy of the Lord. He that is full of mercy... Let him be cheerful in the Lord. Okay. Conflict and friction between these gifts working have to have an oil or you're going to have friction. You're going to have overheating. You're going to have seizing. And you're going to have blow-ups. That's what happens to an engine when a bunch of parts are working together without oil. And so the whole next section of Romans 12 deals with the oil that keeps the parts moving together. Amen. I'm going to read this next section from the ampli. Oh, my goodness. I don't even have time to get into this next section. It's a quarter to nine. It's past your bedtime. Two or three of you said, who cares? And the rest of you said, thank God you finally noticed. <laughs> now, for you two or three junkies, I'll meet you in my office, and we'll go on to midnight. But for the rest of you, I'll, I'll release you in the joy of the Lord. But uh, we'll get together next Wednesday, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll go through this oil of relationships. How, how are we going to keep the parts working together without blowing up? Come on up, guys. Hallelujah. 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 Everybody say, my gift, my, gift. my, war. my war. I'm going to use my gift. And I'm not going to let the warfare stop it. Amen. But, you know, it's so much easier knowing you're going to have these problems than to get blindsided. 
I love to study human temperament because I know what I'm dealing with before I even have the issue. You know, I love profiling people in their temperament because your temperament tells me the red flags I can wave at you. Your temperament, you know, if you're a melancholy temperament, I know if I criticize something you do and I don't do it in the right way, I'm going to lock you up. If you're a sanguine, I've got to make sure that you're not sensing rejection from me and I'm making sure that with everything I give you, I'm making sure. Now, I approve, you know, I approve you because a sanguine's greatest fear is loss of social approval. If you're a cleric, if you're the only 2% of you, well, there's more than that in this church because of our style. But if you're a cleric, man, your greatest fear is being taken advantage of. And so you want to do everything and you want to volunteer for everything. And then about the time you do, all of a sudden you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're taking advantage of me. Well, you volunteered. <laughs> yeah, but this ain't right. Amen. And if you're a phlegmatic personality, which is 62 to 66% of you, the majority, your greatest fear is loss of security. We'll be back next week. Same God time, same God station. We'll be here for you. Hallelujah. Security. Hey, I need to know we're stable. And this church stretches phlegmatics. Because you can be here three years still trying to figure out if I'm crazy or not. <laughs> Pastor Dave, he just, he just, he just, choo, choo, she just does these. I know. But I'll be here next week. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's going to be all right. Hallelujah. The Lord is with us. And, and for security-minded people, we got a great track record. Amen. When I, when I meet an S personality, I look at him and I want to I wanna say, hey, let me show you 27 years of faithful ministry. And I know you're scared to trust me because you just met me. But let me show you 27 years of history. Amen. I did run off with the secretary, but she was my wife. You got to stack the deck in your favor. You know what I mean? People say, why is his wife in the office? Have you checked the newspapers lately? Better my wife be in there than me run off with your wife. Can you say amen? She's never more than a few feet away from me, honey. Amen. We, we stack the deck in our favor. I didn't do all this to crash and burn in the last of it, you know what I mean. I didn't walk 27 years being faithful to my wife to crash and burn in the 38th year. I'm going to keep her close. And I found out she's got radar. Oh, yeah. You say, honey, yes, dear. I don't like the way that woman looked at you. Really? I'm telling you, yes, dear. And not that that happens a lot. I know a guy's good looking as me. It's hard to believe that don't happen more. <laughs> I got to lighten you up a little bit. That's a pretty heavy message, you know. Oh, hallelujah. Some of y'all thought you was taking the nails in your hands and feet. You know? <laughs> hallelujah. Stand with me tonight. Father, Every one of us aspire to fulfill our call. Every one of us aspire to fulfill our call. Lord, our destiny was designed before you even created the earth. Our names were written in your book. Father, we know that we have potential inside of us.
Out of your potency, we have potential. You're omnipotent and we are potential. We're the children of the omnipotent. And I pray that every person in this room, through these instructions of Romans 12, fulfills their call. That not one person in this room would take unfulfilled potential to their grave. But everyone, I, you know what I want on my tombstone? He was used up. Nothing left. The guy was used up, wore out, done. I want to say like Paul, I fulfilled my course. I finished my race. Hallelujah. And now I'm ready for the next segment. I'm ready for this corruption to put on incorruption. And this mortal to put on immortality. Hallelujah. How many of y'all want to run your race? Just lift your hands to heaven. I will fulfill my call. Say that with me. I will, I will fulfill, fulfill my call. My call. I, will I will give you, give you my, all. my all. Father, tonight, Father, tonight take all of me. For my destiny, I will fulfill my call. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, I know there's a high calling in my life. Say it. I know there's a heavenly call for my life. To be fulfilled on the earth in my lifetime. And I will find it. I will fight for it. And I will fulfill it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Now, some of you, who in here would say, I know that there's a call inside me to be a soul winner? Lift your hand. I know inside me there's a call to be a soul winner. In other words, evangelism is your root gift. I want to lead people to Jesus. My heartbeat is get them saved, get them saved, get them saved. Okay. This weekend, there are going to be thousands, thousands of Ohio River Valley people at that city park for 24 hours, walking and praying, believing God. And I encourage you to be a witness. If you're called to evangelism, get yourself, you know, get your script down. Know how you're going to approach people. If anybody has never led him by the Lord. You know, our, my home church in Fort Worth, last Saturday, 31 people went out on the streets and they led 350 people to Jesus in two and a half hours. In nine months, Pastor Bob's church has led 23,000 people through the sinner's prayer in nine months in Fort Worth, Texas. Pastor Bob Nichols, my pastor. They are averaging right now, they are averaging 42 people a Sunday being born again at the altar during the altar call. 42 a Sunday. Right now, that's the week average. When I was there last Sunday, it was 20 or 37. He said, we're down a little this week. That's what I'm telling you, man. I got my fuse lit. And so we're going to be talking more about that, how this summer we can make a difference in our valley again. We can throw the net again in our valley. But if you got a call to evangelism and you're not down there this week witnessing, you're missing your call. 
because the city is assembled for you. If anybody don't know how to do it, go to Revival Fire Ministries, Rodney Howard Brown's website. He's got a whole packet on there. You download it for free, and it'll tell you and school you in exactly how to lead someone to Jesus. I don't have time to do it between now and Friday night. If you need that, some people say, I don't need that. I'm ready to go right now. My guns are loaded. But some people, they need that little extra help. They're, maybe you're a little bit of an introvert. You say, I'm a little uncomfortable doing that. Go to that website, Revival Fire Ministries, Rodney Howard Brown. Download that soul winning packet. Print it out. Study it up and hit the streets. Compel them to come. Amen? If that's your root gift. Or you can sit back, and one day we'll put a tombstone in your grave that says, unfulfilled potential. I was scared. I was scared. That's why I didn't do it. Amen. Can I get my prayer team up here tonight? If you need prayer tonight before you leave this place, please come and get prayer. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for aspiring to fulfill the call of God. Thank you for aspiring to fulfill the qualifications in the house of God. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name.